Who would think getting old was so much hard work, eh? Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to church. Today, we're allowed to have more people joining us here in the building. So if you're still on Zoom or on YouTube, you'd be made very welcome if you wish to come along in person once again. But you still need to book in via church suite if you do want to come along. Today sees the first of our tribe gatherings. This is aimed at family groups and young people, and that will be at five o'clock today here in the church. We're desperate to see our children and young people being able to return to church activities. Um, and again, if you want to join us, you have to book in via church suite. Many of you will remember Anne Davidson, or to us, she was Anne Watson. And as you know, she unexpectedly passed away a few months ago. Due to the COVID restrictions at the time, the family were unable to have the kind of funeral and celebration of Anne's life that they would have liked. So Billy and Amy would like to invite all of you that knew Anne to a short committal service at the Hills of Dunipay Cemetery on Saturday the 14th of August at 11am and that will be to bury Anne's ashes with her mum and dad and the dress code is whatever you feel comfortable in, apparently. Psalm 46 says, God is a refuge and strength, a never present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way, and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river, whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her, she will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, the earth is The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought in the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Let's pray. Lord, we give you grateful thanks that you are our refuge, you are our strength, and you're always present in every struggle and difficulty in our lives. Thank you for being here with us today. Help us to be still and know that you are God. Help us to put our struggles to one side and concentrate on you. Meet with us today. Be to us whatever we need. Teach us whatever you need us to learn in order to live the life you want us to live. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, that others might be drawn to you through us, and that you might be glorified in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Feel free to stand now uh, if you want, and we're going to sing our next song, which is Take Us to the River, and then straight after this, Lindsay is going to lead us in prayer. Your salvation to live this generation. 
tuning let everything that has life good morning i'm going to do our prayer of thanksgiving from a meditation from the northumbria community by lawrence tuning let everything that has life let everything that has breath give all the glory and honor and praise to the one who overcame death let every living thing Sing of the mercies of our God. Let us exalt him wherever we live with thanksgiving and joy in our hearts. If we don't praise him, the mountains will. If we don't exalt him, the rocks will cry out in our stead. God is not dead. Let every living thing sing of the mercies of our God. Let us exalt him wherever we live with thanksgiving and joy in our hearts. Amen. Our next song is Mighty to Save. So we're going to sing that and then Bev is going to come up after that and read a passage from God's Word.
is mighty to say, he is mighty to say, forever, author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the Morning, everyone. Get my glasses. Right, we're reading from Ecclesiastics 4, verses 1 to 12. Again, I looked and saw the oppression that was taking place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed, and they have no comforter. Power was on the side of their oppressors, and they have no comforter. And I declared that the dead who had already died are happier than the living who are still alive. But better than both is the one who has never been born who has not seen the evil that is done under the sun. And I saw, all, I saw that all toil and all achievement sprung from the one person's envy of another. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Fools fold their hands and ruin themselves. Better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. Again, I saw something meaningless under the sun. There was a man all alone who had neither son nor brother, there was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling, he asked, and why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is meaningless, a miserable business. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labour. If neither of them falls down, one can help the other up, but pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm, but how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Thank you, Beth. And just before Alan comes and ministers to us, let's pray. Father, life has been tough for everyone the world over during this time of pandemic. But for many, there have also been other disasters to contend with, like hurricanes, floods, wildfires, drought, famine, civil wars, and migrant and refugee crisis. These things haven't gone away with the pandemic. Lord, we pray for those coping with these disasters, but especially for the vulnerable and marginalized people who do not have the health care that we are privileged to have, or proper or decent homes where they can shield from the virus. We pray for Nigeria and the continued persecution there, for those who have been ki kidnapped or killed, for the homes and churches that have been burned down even in the last month. But we pray also for Muslim children that have been kidnapped too, some as young as two years old, with ridiculous ransom amounts being asked that families can never afford to pay. Lord, we pray that the Nigerian authorities will get on top of these terrorist organizations and that the international community will hold that government to account, but also assist it in combating these groups. And Lord, we're dismayed and ashamed that the drug-related deaths in Scotland have hit record levels again. And in many cases, the root cause is poverty. And so just as we have prayed for poverty in our world, we pray for our own country and indeed our own communities and neighbourhoods. Thank you for those who work with these neighbourhoods, for food bank, for CAP, for Roots. And Lord, as your people, may we be ready to rise up and get out of our comfort zones and get involved with these and other groups. Thank you for the privilege of being able to walk the church's neighbourhood and pray. We ask for blessing on the homes and businesses around here and that you will give us favour with them, that it will open doors to enable us to bring help and also to point them to the Saviour that they don't know they need. Lord, anoint your servant Alan this morning and reveal your word to us through him. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everyone. 
Good to see you all. Let me get this screen out the road so I can see you properly. Just means I can't burst into song in the middle of the sermon, that's all. Could be, could be. If you're listening online and you haven't heard the back chat so far, they're just saying that could be a blessing. Right. How do you survive in this dog-eat-dog world? That's the question that the writer of Ecclesiastes was answering in that cheery passage that Bev had to read to us together. As he looked at the oppression in the ancient world, as he noticed that power seemed to always be on the side of the oppressor and the wealthy, his rather depressing conclusion is, it would be better off that you had never been born. He considers a man all alone in the world, and he basically asks the question, what is the point of this type of life without anyone to enjoy life with? All this work, this collecting of stuff, possessions, is just meaningless. But then he touches on the idea of friendship, relationship. And he proclaims here in friendship is the source of fulfillment in life. This is the means of survival, even thriving in this world. If you're going to do well, then you need to have friends. Relationship is what life is all about. And Wisdom literature in the Old Testament has a lot to say about friendship with people as well as friendship with God. In fact, when God creates this beautiful world in the opening passages of the Old Testament, the only thing that seems to be wrong in this perfect world is that Adam is alone. And God said it wasn't good. Everything else was good, but God says it wasn't good for Adam to be on his own. Isolation is bad for people. Relationship, companionship, friendship, we are made for these things. We're not designed to survive or even thrive without one another. That's why isolation is such a big solitary confinement, it's such a big punishment in the world. You know, currently one quarter of people in Britain today describe themselves as having no close friends. One quarter. Friday was International Friendship Day. Did anybody celebrate it? No. Doesn't it get much PR, does Friendship Day? Valentine's Day, that's another matter. If it's to do with love and sex, it's high up the agenda. If it's due to about friendship, nobody talks about it. Where's the self-help guides to friendship? There's plenty of self-help guides to love and marriage and relationship, and sex and all that sort of stuff. But where is it for friendship? They don't exist. We know that it is the isolation of lockdown that has been particularly painful for people stuck in home alone. People craving physical connection. Who would have thought a year would pass before you could hug your granny or hug your mommy? The, the Word of God teaches us that relationships are central. And we can confirm that from our own experience of life in the past year. Friends, people whose lives are in, our lives are intertwined with are important and a huge influence on us. So let's look at what this wisdom literature of Ecclesiastes in the book of Proverbs has to tell us about friendship. The first thing it says is choose your friends carefully. Choose your friends carefully. Family, you don't get a choice over, but friends, you do. Proverbs 13, verse 20. He who walks with the wise grows wise, but a companion of fools suffers harm. Friends have a huge influence on us. Things pass backwards and forwards between friends that make and shape who we are. Our values, our convictions, our morality, our habits, our goals, they are all impacted and influenced by the small group of people that we call our closest friends, those we open up our hearts to, those we turn to in times of challenge. 
It's as if we're all cells stacked and joined by a semi-permeable membrane where things can pass backwards and forwards, flows in and out. You know, in that nature and nurture argument, so much of you is made up by your DNA. You've got no choice on that. But on the nurture side of things, friends are part of that nurture, especially as we grow out of childhood and into adulthood. We, we, we get so much from our genetic makeup, but we get so much more influence by those who are around us and who shape us. And so the Bible says, choose carefully who you allow to influence you, who you spend time with, who you get close to. Paul said to the church in Corinth, bad company corrupts good character. I had a, a young man at uh, he might be watching this, so I'm going to call him John. That wasn't his real name, just in case he is. A young man who was in my youth group called John many years ago. And, and, and John was hard to get a hold of. When he came to Bible class, he was a nightmare. You know, most of the time he'd be in your face. He'd be arguing. Somebody take him away and give him a good lesson. It's kind of sometimes how he made you feel. And, oh, he was different. And then he'd come in one week and he'd just be like, bro, absolutely perfect, asking good questions, engaging, helpful, anything I can do for you, Al. And then we'd go another four, five, six weeks where he'd be a nightmare and then we'd get a week or two where he was absolutely brilliant. I had no idea what was going on. I used to think, what, what John are we going to get today? And, 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 and what is causing John to flip like this? And I sat down with his mum and dad one day and I said, yeah, John is an amazing young man. I said, when he's on form, he really is on form. And see, when he's off form, it's a nightmare. And they said, when was the last time you saw him on form? I said, it was a couple of weeks ago. Ah, that'll be right. And I said, you mean you know why? He said, oh, it's dead easy. He hangs about with these bunchy guys and his behavior gets worse and worse and worse. And then we ground them. And when we ground them, you see the nice John. And for a couple of weeks, he's the nice John. And then we kind of ground him forever. So he hangs about with this crowd of lads and his behavior goes down, 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 down. Then we ground them, and it's nice John's back again. Bad company corrupts. But it's not just in young people. It happens amongst adults as well. Some people act very differently at church as they do in work or at home or in a social environment. They, they respond to those who are around them. Proverbs 16 verse 3 says, Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. And that includes our friendships. We should seek friends who are people of noble character, people who we aspire to, to, to be like. If you're an impatient person, find somebody who's patient and befriend them and let that patience rub off on you. Proverbs 13 verse 20 says, he who walks with the wise grows wise, but a companion of fools suffers harm. So the first thing Proverbs tells us is choose friends carefully. And then once you've chosen them, treat those friends well. Proverbs 27 verse 10, do not forsake your friends. One of the most well-known Proverbs in the Bible is, there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And another says, a friend loves at all times. And in the Ecclesiastes passage we read together, talks of a friend helping to pick up their fallen friend. When somebody falls over, a friend comes and picks you up. They're not for fair weather only. Proverbs 17, 17 says, a friend loves at all times, whatever the circumstances. Proverbs 20, verse 6 says, many claim to have unfailing love, but a faithful person who can find. They know it's difficult to find friends that are faithful. So when you find one, Treat them well. There are, of course, warnings in Proverbs about people who want to be our friends because of the gifts that we have that we might share, the riches that we have that we might share, the positions of power and influence that we might have 
and share. Proverbs says these are not the friends you want. When we fall into poverty, when our influence proves powerless, those types of friends just move away and we're left on our own. That's not friendship. Friends are those you can phone at two in the morning and say, I need your help. And as they struggle to put their clothes on, they just ask the one question, where are you? So that they can be with you. Friends are the people who turn up, who will hold you when you've mucked up, when you're embarrassed, or when you've fallen to temptation. Friends are the ones who will be there. As verse 11 of Ecclesiastes 4 suggests, it's friends who bring warmth, not just physical, but emotional warmth. The picture of verse 11 and 12 is, is one of security and, and warmth and, and rest. And a good friend does this for us. They, they protect our back. The picture is of two soldiers going into combat with their swords. And they draw their swords and then they stand back to back so that they can defend one another's back as they, as they attack the enemy. And no one can stab your friend in the back because you are there protecting them. And you're not going to stab them in the back either because you are a good friend. That's the type of picture that, that we bring into friendship. Friends don't stab each other in the back, neither do they allow someone else to do it. They don't sit and listen to gossip about their friends. They defend their friends. When they see the danger approaching their friends in life, they speak up and they warn them of the danger that is in front of them. Often we need to fight that temptation to stay quiet and sit still for the sake of our friendship. Often we think we might risk our friendship if we say something that they might take the wrong way. But the reality is in saying those things that protect our friends long term, we deepen friendship. Friends are so precious, we can't afford to let them down because we can't afford them to let us down when we need them. So we should thank God for friends who know you and love you and are committed to you and will tell you what you need to hear even when you don't want to hear it. Proverbs 27.10 says, Do not forsake your friends. Treat them well. And then Proverbs goes on and teaches us that we need to speak to friends and we need to listen to friends. Proverbs 27.6, Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Not when you're stabbed in the back, but when they poke you in the chest. <laughs> When they say, hey, hold on a minute here. I just need to have a wee word with you. Faithful are the wounds of a friend who plucks up the courage to point out the character flaw before it hurts you even more. When they warn you of a dangerous trap you're about to fall into, listen to them. Acquaintances will always tell you what you want to hear. Friends will tell you what you need to hear. Enemies will put you down. Friends might tell you things that make you feel a bit down, but it's so that they can lift you up in the long term. There are two sides to this. As a friend, we may need to learn to speak, and we may need to learn to listen. King David, despite his wonderful example of friendship with Jonathan, and that, that, that's a world-famous friendship was still terrible at speaking to his own son, Adonijah. 1 King 1.6, we're told David was rubbish at parenting and not addressing the weaknesses of his children, whereas he had been good at it with Jonathan. So sometimes we just need to take a deep breath, speak the truth with gentle love, and then our friends can grow. If it's received in the spirit it's given, it will have a sweet effect. Proverbs 27 verse 9 uses perfume as the, the metaphor to describe it. Perfume and incense bring joy to the heart, and the pleasantness of a friend springs from their heartfelt advice. 
So when they say something that's maybe hard to hear, treat it as perfume in the room. Oh, that's good. A friend has done this for me. It's wonderful. It's beautiful. A friend can hear you and know you in a way that's impossible to hear yourself as well. Don't know if any of you, when you start public speaking and preaching, they encourage you to listen back to what you preach and say. It's horrendous. I, I don't know if you've ever had to do it. You record yourself and then you listen back. You go, I don't sound like that, do I? You know, and the reason is you don't sound like that to you because you hear your voice through your own body and bones vibrating. Everybody else hears their voice differently. Folks say, I sound like my dad used to sound like. And I don't think I sound like my dad sounds like until I listen to myself back and then I think I know what they're saying. Well, the same thing is true in friendship. Sometimes we don't kind of hear our own self. We don't get our own character. We don't see our own mistakes and stuff like that. It's very hard to hear that. So the friend is the person who's the recording, who's doing the listening back for you, saying, do you know how you sound? Do you know how that comes across? Do you? And that's what a, a wonderful friend will do for you. They'll let you hear yourself. And I have no idea where I am in my notes just now. <laughs> but there's another way of coming together as friends that's not described as perfume. In fact, it's almost described as the opposite. We, 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 we go from this beautiful room of scented perfume to the blacksmith's workshop where it talks in verse 17, as iron sharpens iron. From the sweet smell of perfume to the sweaty, hot smell of the blacksmith's workshop, to the noise of steel on steel, iron on iron, the hammer pounding down on the anvil as the sword is beaten into shape. That healthy clash of ideas where good friends disagree forcefully with one another and, and work it out and get to the conclusion. The anvil that will not give no matter how often that hammer pounds and pounds and pounds on top of it. That heated debate that helps shape us. I had a, a, a friend at college and we still keep up to this day called Tim and that is his real name. And, 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 and Tim and I could go hammer and tongs in the car coming back from college after a lecture, arguing counterpoint to counterpoint, and then get in and make the tea together and be absolutely fine. My work colleagues at the Baptist Union of Scotland a couple of years ago, sometimes if, if visitors had come in and heard us in a national team meeting, as we were having really robust discussions, and yet, they were based on a really sweet and secure friendship and relationship and love and respect for one another. And it was only because we had that love and respect that we could go hammer and tongs and it not affect us in any way. That healthy clash of ideas and that gentle perfume are two ways of having conversations within friendships. And finally, there's a vulnerability in friendship that Proverbs talks about. There's strength in friendship, the strength of three cords intertwined, but there is also vulnerability. In making friends, we open ourselves up. We, we make ourselves vulnerable. Uh, many years ago, I was introducing a Baptist minister who was preaching at our anniversary service. And in the evening when I was introducing them, uh, I said, and, and Mark is a really good friend. And later on in the evening, Mark took me aside and said, did you mean that? What? When you said, and Mark is a really good friend, did you mean that? Or was it just for show? And I went, I meant it. And from that day on, he made sure it was a reality. And although we live many miles apart, for the last 
25 years since that comment was made. We do things to make sure that friendship remains. We find time to go on holiday together. We, we make sure we meet up even on these video calls and stuff. We know what's happening in our children's lives. We pray for one another. When we're making big decisions in life, we talk to each other about those decisions. We keep that friendship going. But some people have tried to make friendships and found the pain of broken friendships too hard to handle, and too hard to risk again. That's why he was asking, did I mean it? Others shared things with people who they thought were friends to discover they shared with gossips and had their life spread around town. Some people thought they were, had friends that had, could have an iron sharpens iron conversation, and when they tried to have it, that was the last conversation they ever had. Proverbs 16 warns us that gossips separate friends. Proverbs 17 talks about how speaking about past mistakes destroys friendships. Unless we take those steps of risk, of vulnerability, we say, do you really mean that? Do you want us to become good friends? Then we might lose great chances for friendship. Peter and Jesus. Peter promises to stand by Jesus. He has good, good intentions, and then he fails to deliver. He falls asleep, he runs away, and then denies knowing Jesus three times. And yet on the beach a few days later, their friendship is restored. Friendships are a voluntary thing. They're a tying of our hearts. This week, a minister that I'm helping in their church in a very small way says, Alan, and I don't know you, but I hope we become good friends. And I was nearly ready to say, do you mean that? I don't even know him well enough to say that. But I know I now have a decision to make and questions to ask. Why does he want to be my friend? What does he mean by friendship? Is friendship the relationship he needs from me right now, or does he need something else from me? Do I want to invest in exploring what friendship might mean with him in the long term? I guess in some way he has been vulnerable right at the start in saying, I hope we can become good friends. I just need to work out what he means by that and how I should respond. This world is a tough place to live. As the writer of Ecclesiastes said, people spend a lot of time chasing after the wind. Can't gasp it. Nothing to take hold of. But there is a relationship. There is a prize to be cherished, honored, protected, and developed called friendship. Friendships that will mold and make us as we walk together through this world. And it's vital to choose them carefully, treat them well, speak words of challenge, listen to words of challenge, and choose to be vulnerable if you want to be open and deepen friendships. Therefore, it says cultivate a good quantity and a good quality of friendship. The final message of Ecclesiastes is very straightforward. It says there is a relationship with the true and living God that is described as a friendship. That's the great discovery of Ecclesiastes as he tells you that life is meaningless and a chasing after the wind and nothing that can be grasped. He then says, but there is a friendship with God that can be grasped. A friendship that will never let us down. Someone who will never abuse our vulnerability, who will speak challenging words into our lives, but always out of a heart of love. And that is a friendship we are called to choose above all others and to model our other friendships on. If that's a friendship that is in your life, then cultivate it. Develop it. Choose your friends wisely to help you grow that. If that's a friendship that's not yet in your life, then give me a phone. 
send me an email if you're watching online. You'll find it on the website for the church or get in touch via Facebook or whatever. And let's talk about friendship with Christ and see how that might impact your life and bring new meaning and new hope to other relationships as well.
you are a great God and we will always worship you in your holy name. Thank you for your unconditional love. Lord, so many have been isolated during this pandemic. May we be aware of those around us, neighbours and those in our church family. And as Christians, may we be good friends, the best of friends. And more than that, may others see that we are your friend. And Lord, we commit the week ahead to you, whatever it might hold. May we always walk the road with you, our hand in yours. Amen. Rise